there life on other planets? Are there conscious beings on other planets? Or are there actually aliens in our planet and we just don't know about it? But even though the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, we can still see it today. If we go to Mars and we discover life there, then that says life does develop everywhere. Being able to kind of time travel, that's a way of visiting the future. Is there life elsewhere? Hi, Mark. Thank you for coming to the studio. I know you're a long way from home, so it's uh, it's really cool that you're here in person. Um, he's actually a senior scientific advisor for the European Space Agency. He's also an astronomer, and he has a spiritual side. So we will definitely talk about that and dive into that later in the podcast. But now that we got that um, done, uh, let's take off okay. into, um, into the top of everything, which is your experience at the European Space Agency. Uh, please feel free to share anything um, that you witnessed while you're at your time there um, that you think the audience might not know about? Yeah, so I joined the European Space Agency 15 years ago. I've been okay. an astronomer, um, of course, throughout my whole career. Um, just to sort of put a background on that, I'm British. I okay. did my undergraduate and, and uh, postgraduate degrees at the University of Edinburgh. Oh, and wow, then I moved okay. to the US to work for NASA for a while. Okay. Um, you know, that's kind of always the thing, right? In olden days, you know, NASA and America is the great dream. Mm -hmm. um, I was working on Hubble Space Telescope just when it got launched in 1990. So that's a long oh, time wow. ago. And that's still okay. in operation. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were problems with Hubble at the beginning. From the outset, there was this problem with the optics, which meant that it couldn't take sharp images. And I, in fact, I lost my job to that um, okay. because some money was taken back from the project I was working on to fix Hubble. And, you know, in a, in a, a chaotic sense, let's say, mm -hmm. I ended up then moving back to Europe and moved to Germany. And I've been using big ground-based telescopes then, um, most of which are in places like Chile, okay. um, working with what's called the European Southern Observatory. Okay. So this E at Europe has been really important in my life. Okay. Um, and then moved to the UK, went back for a while and got offered this job or applied for the job, got offered the job at the mm -hmm. European Space Agency. And space is the place to be for certain kinds of astronomy, for sure. Yeah. But the project I was involved with already at that point is a thing called the James Webb Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's on the logo here on the shirt. Um, I had been involved in that for almost 10 years already, I think, at that yeah. point. Then the opportunity came to move to ESA, stay involved in the project, but then have a broad view over many other projects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's so many different missions that we fly uh, in collaboration with NASA and with Japan mm -hmm. and well, other partners around the world. But probably the one, you know, even though we'll come to it, I'm sure, talking about James Webb Space Telescope, which is the one I started on, the one which probably emotionally means the most to me and therefore that kind of comes in a sense to connectedness and spirituality, if you like, is the mission called Rosetta. Rosetta, okay. And Rosetta is now at its 10th anniversary of the thing which it's famous for. It mm -hmm. was launched actually 20 years ago in 2004 uh, on a journey towards a comet, uh, Comet 67P churumov gerasimenko okay. um, named for the, the astronomers that discovered it. Mm -hmm. And the Rosetta mission was going to go to that comet, rendezvous with it, fly around it, and then land on the surface. Um, and that, that all happened. Um, so the big year for that was 2014. Uh, we, the spacecraft had been asleep for two and a half years in hibernation out towards Jupiter in the cold of space. It had to wake up in order, as, so it was going to rendezvous with the comet later that year. Okay. And had to wake up, come back to life. And there was this really exciting moment in January 2014 where everybody's thinking, will it, won't it? And, and the, the tension in the room when we were waiting to get that signal back, because we weren't commanding it. We won't say, wake up. It had to wake itself up on an alarm clock. Oh, um, okay. So there was yeah. that real tension. And then that all happened, and then kind of flood of interest in the mission uh, awoke. And we did so many things that year to work with people to publicize the mission, but also share the science. We okay. got to August, rendezvous, mm -hmm. saw this comet for the first time. November, landed on it. And... I've just just before I arrived, I've been talking to the, um, the person, uh, Elsa Montagnon, the night of the landing on the comet. She was the one who said, we go. Uh, okay. We've just been discussing the 10th anniversary this year mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking about that coming here and knowing what we were going to be talking about really made me reflect on 
the fact that it's human beings that make sp space missions work, right? Yeah. It, it's teams of people that come together. Sure, there's a metal box out there somewhere in space, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be there if we didn't decide to do it. It wouldn't be there if we didn't think it was worth dedicating a big fraction of our lives to. Definitely. And it wouldn't be worth doing if everybody else didn't get something from it as well. Yeah, so, that makes so sense. So there's been lots of great mm -hmm. moments in my time with ESA, but that one, uh, working on Rosetta in 2014 until 2016, well, it just still still makes me sort of well up even thinking about it. Wow, no, that's 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 amazing. Um, I, I, now that you were talking about that humans make a lot of the space missions work, in regards to that, nowadays we have AI, right? We have, um, I mean, chat GPT, of course, but then so, so many companies are working on incorporating AI into different kind of um, different machines, different projects and all that. What do you think is the risk of AI in regards to like, will it replace human beings? And especially in regards to space missions, as you were talking about how humans make it work, is there any universe in where maybe astronauts won't be needed anymore? Or like, if, like you have self-driving cars, will, be, will there be self kind of flying, you know, rockets and stuff or? Well, from that sense, of course, most of the things we do actually are robotic. Um, okay. Rosetta mission didn't have an astro astronaut sitting on top yeah. of it. Okay. Um, the, and, and since the Apollo missions of the late 60s, early 70s, no astronaut has been beyond low Earth orbit. Now, of course, now with the Artemis missions going back to the moon, NASA and, and the European Space Agency in Canada will, humans will go back to the moon again fairly soon. But everything else you do um, is robotic. And that in some ways is partly because these missions may take a long time. You can't mm -hmm. send a human all the way out to Jupiter and back, for example. We just launched a new satellite towards Jupiter um, April last year, and that's not going to get there until 2031. So that kind of is a long journey. Yeah. Um, so that's hard. And there are also places which will be much too dangerous for astronauts to go. So we have a, a mission called Solar Orbiter, which is going um, is on a, a trajectory which takes it periodically very close to the sun, and then it loops back mm -hmm. out again. Okay. And if you were a human on board that, well, you would be kind of toast. Um, so it's not a good place for humans to go. So this synergy between human missions um, and robotic missions has been around forever. There's nothing new about that for us. The question is, you know, what does a human put into the loop? Where does a human add something? Um, and is that part where the human is, is that replaceable by, by AI? And there's, you know, interesting questions there. So for example, if you send an astronaut down to the surface of the moon or into the surface of Mars, let's say in the future, um, if they're a trained geologist, are they going to be better able to spot the one rock out of the 3,000, which mm. is the weird one? Yeah. Okay, because they've had years of training. We're all very good at pattern recognition. You know, you can spot that one thing. And we've tried to run demonstrations where um, you try to get robots to do that. And, uh -huh. and aut autonomous, autonomously find the interesting rock amongst many. And I suppose today that wouldn't work. But who's to say that AI couldn't do that in the future? But then, you know, spaceflight a little bit is also about the human endeavor and the human mystery. Yeah, true. Um, and astronauts are avatars, right? They represent you and me. They represent people when they go there. They can come back and relate their experiences. People, people relate to people. Um, yes, we you can make people relate to robots, and we did with Rosetta and Philae. The little lander went to the surface. We kind of anthropomorphized them, made cartoons about them, mm -hmm. and people felt sympathy for them, even though they're just metal boxes. Yeah. Um, but that's a whole other level if the astronaut comes back, and uh, you, I, you see that with our astronauts. You, it's almost slightly weird, you know. People want to touch an astronaut. You've been to space, I, you know. There's, but you know that, right? That there are many endeavors where this Premier League footballer or this actor, or you know, there's a your. I don't want to say the classic phrase "living the dream," but at some level, yes, these are doing things which most people never will, and that can be inspirational. And we shouldn't ever can. Forget that, right? Oh, definitely. There's been lots of people saying for years, get rid of astronauts, we can do everything with robots. I'm not really, I don't think that that's particularly clever, not because it's the most effective way of doing the science, but it is often the way that keeps the public interest in spending what is a lot of money on things yeah. which otherwise, you know, you could say, why don't you build hospitals instead? Um, I'm not saying that sending a human to Mars will just wipe away all human poverty. Not at mm -hmm. all, of course not. But 
creating that human connection and saying beyond the kind of mundane life I have where I have to go to school or go to the shops and do my work, there's a little bit of an aspect of dreaming and the humans in a way do that better than the robots do. Wow. Wow. That's all giving me, giving me a lot to think about. <laughs> um, now, this might be the you know science fiction movie geek in me asking you, <laughs> so I apologize in advance, uh, but I wanted to talk to you about time travel. Okay. Now- you have these movies like Interstellar and stuff where people are like, and I think I read this online. It might be from the movie, but it might be online where I read it. But I heard somewhere where it's like, if you if you go near a black hole, um, time changes or something like uh, like one year on Earth. If you're near a black hole or you're going through a black hole, it's like 80 years or something like that. And and like I wanted to know about is time travel possible or is it very theoretical or what what is that whole whole uh, shebang about yeah that's a great question there there are some aspects of time travel which are very simple and there are some aspects which are more complicated so in a, in a way let's talk about kind of the simple thing um you're sitting across the room from me uh we're separated by let's say a meter and a half two meters it has taken a certain number of nanoseconds for the for light from you to travel to me i'm not seeing you as you are now i'm seeing you as you were in the past right? Nanoseconds in the past. Yeah. When we look at the sun, we're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. It takes that long for light to get here. So being able to kind of time travel, not necessarily in your body, but to be able to see things as they used to be, we do that all the time. But of course, you and I, we feel like we're just in the same time, right? But astronomy is very much about seeing the past because okay. we look out so far away from Earth that it can take millions or billions of years for that light to have traveled to us. So for example, the James Webb Space Telescope is looking for objects which are so far away from us, it's taken so long for the light to get here, that actually we're seeing them as they were shortly after the Big Bang. So even though the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, we can still see it today because you just have to look far enough away that it's taken that time for light to get here. Oh, wow. Right. So, so everything we do in astronomy is a kind of look back. Now, some things are close by the sun. We don't talk about the sun. We're seeing the history of the sun. It's eight minutes ago. That feels like, you know, and of course on earth, we're used to the fact that we're sitting here in Delhi. It's kind of lunchtime, mid afternoon. Um, the people in Europe are just getting up. The people in Japan are beginning to go to, you know, they're having their evening. So that kind of desynchronization, we're kind of used to that. But not really used to it when you talk about billions of years ago in the past. It's like opening up a, a textbook and seeing pictures of, you know, ancient India or ancient Rome and saying, oh, look, we can still see that. But but we're seeing a living movie of it. It's not just a painting oh, in a book, okay. right? We're seeing things happening in the past and it's taken that time for light to get here. Now you would say, okay, what does that teach me? Um, well, the universe was different when it was young. Um, so we actually see that galaxies look different, the, the very distant ones, they look quite different to the ones which are around us today because they've evolved, they've changed over cosmic time. So in that sense, time travel in a kind of a, in a, in a sense of being able to look back, mm -hmm. we do that all the time. Now this thing about time travel where, you know, black holes and so on, this is Einstein's world, this is special relativity and general relativity. And if you posit that the speed of light is finite, which it is, that it takes some time for light to travel from A to B, then there's all sorts of consequences that Einstein and other scientists worked out more than 100 years ago um, called the theory of relativity. And if I travel super, super fast, if I accelerate at a high speed and go out close to the speed of light, in my reference frame, my clock is ticking just as it ever was, right? So time doesn't slow down at all for me. I'm watching my watch. It's one second per second. You know, it's time for tea. It's time for life. It's all the same. But you, looking at me back from Earth, if I've gone off, you see my clock very differently. You perceive my clock going much more slowly. Now, you can't actually perceive it in the sense because I've gone off so fast. You know, the signal's coming back. It, it, it gets a bit more complicated. But if I go out there... For a couple of years close to the speed of light and then come back close to the speed of light then yeah indeed a century could have passed here while just a couple of years passed for me in space so in that sense if you like that's a way of visiting the future 
right? But it's non-causal, it, by which I mean I can't affect the... It, it, okay. Time travel is often the, the 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 paradox of time travel is often in the other direction, going backwards. Right? If I just go out and come back in the future, that's possible. Okay. Going back into the past has a whole d different, you know, uh, problem with it, right? Okay. Because if I go back into the past to just when we started this, you know, this 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 podcast, and I, you know, one of the cameramen, you know, we we call somebody up and say you've got to run out into the street now. We change the whole dynamic of the way the podcast works, right? Um, I changed the history from there on. Uh, so that kind of interfering with the past stuff, uh, you know, and killing your own grandfather kind of thing, so you're never born, the paradox of, well, how do you ever go and kill him? Then he's alive again, and then, you, they, then you're alive, then you go back and kill him. So those sorts of paradoxes are, are not allowed in physics. But the thing you mentioned in particular, going near a black hole, mm -hmm. um, that's gravity, which is uh, changing. Um, it's effectively stretching space-time. So... Everybody knows about space, right? This, around us, up there. Everybody knows about time, the thing on the dial. What most people don't realize is they're actually the same thing. They're linked to each other. We don't talk about space, and we don't talk about time. In physics, we talk about space-time. And that's because it's if there's gravity in a certain location, um, a mass, you know, a black hole, or even a planet, um, that changes the fabric of space-time, and it changes the flow of time relative to other places. Wow. Right. So this is what interstellar posits, right? You get close into the gravity of the black hole, and you get too close, and suddenly you've, you've oh, oh we, you know, everything's changed on the, on the other side. Wow. But could a human being actually survive going through a black hole? Or would it, like, would he, like, just get torn apart? <laughs> well, yeah, there's this thing called spaghettification, right? Kind of cool thing, right? If, if, if you get a, close to a, a small black hole, so the the the, um, the strength of gravity increases as you get clearly as you get closer and closer to the black hole, and if you're in a if a, a small black hole, the rate of change of gravity over a certain distance is very high. So effectively, you get stretched out, right? It's not like a Willy Wonka thing, right? Where you know, is it um, you've eaten the wrong sweetie and it stretches you out into this gummy band, right? Um, and that, of course, disrupts all your molecules. That's not, uh -huh. you know, you, you, you don't come out of that looking so good. Um, but here's the weird thing. If you get close to a supermassive black hole, so even bigger, the radius over which the gravity changes there is much larger. Mm -hmm. And you don't get spaghettified in the same way. So you can actually, in principle, survive a fall into a very big black hole, which is what happens in Interstellar. Here's the weird thing, though. For you, you journey into this black hole, and everything's kind of cool. And you're, you know, motoring along in your spacecraft, and that's all nice. Um, and you fall past the so-called event horizon, um, and it, you don't see a difference at that point. You just you're happy. People on the outside see something completely different. As you move towards the event horizon, everything seems to slow down and slow down and slow down from their perspective to the point you never actually cross that limit you never actually cross that line you're stuck on it forever from their perspective and so that asynchronization between how space and time work locally and in, in a relative sense to each other is actually it's, it's real and you might think it's all abstract as well right what do i care well you know you probably have a mobile phone and you use the gps on it to navigate around the GPS, uh, GPS is the American system, Galileo, the European, now these satellites in orbit, they, ha they have very accurate clocks on them. So these clocks, essentially, by sending time signals backwards and forwards to your phone, uh -huh. and from three, three or more of these satellites simultaneously, the time differences w help you work out where you are, right? The satellites know where they are, and they send these time stamps. And, and so... That's how it works, but they're at quite a high altitude above the Earth. The mm -hmm. gravity's different there. Okay. And that means they're actually in a different time frame. And they have to correct for that. They actually actively have to correct, knowing general relativity, they have to correct the timestamps they send out for where they are in Earth's gravitational field, because we're in a different part of it. Yeah. So if general relativity didn't work, and you didn't put those corrections in, you'd crash into every second building or drive off the bridge because you would just be in the wrong place. Um, so it does have very practical implications in real life. Wow. And um, 
a few minutes ago, you were talking about astronomy, right? Now, and you also told me that you have a spiritual side as well. So in, in your mind, is there any like connection between astronomy and spirituality at all? Yes. Now we have to be you know, clear about what we define as spirituality. I'm not talking about religion here. Um, I'm not a religious person at all. I don't follow any particular set of creeds or any uh, sort of rules on how to run my life. I don't believe in an afterlife. I don't, for me personally, I'm an atheist. I don't, none, none of that aspect, the kind of classical religious aspects exist. But I think there is a, if we define spirituality very broadly, mm -hmm. I would say there definitely is a spiritual aspect to the fact that we, you, I, everybody else here, everybody watching, we're just collections of molecules. Uh, okay. Those molecules have come together um, to make a conscious being. And that conscious being all of a sudden then starts asking questions, you know, where am I from? Where am I going? What's my purpose in life? Religion can, can provide uh, an answer or a framework for seeking answers, but science does as well. Because what's remarkable about many of those molecules is that over the last hundred years, the molecules in our brains have been clever enough to figure out where, the, where those molecules came from. And many of them came from inside stars. Okay. So, so when the universe started 13.8 8 billion years ago, there was hydrogen and helium. Basically, th those, were, those were the only atoms. Hydrogen around the only elements. All the stuff, or a lot of, of course, we do have hydrogen in our bodies that's in the water, H2O. So there's still quite a lot of material left over from the Big Bang in our bodies. It hasn't changed. It's always been like that. Um, but we also have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, potassium, and, and bits and pieces, iron. Uh, all of those elements were made after the Big Bang in the hearts of stars or in the, or in the atmospheres of stars or in supernova explosions. You needed to make one generation of stars first for them to blow up or to die, to belch out winds, put that material back into space, and then process again, process again. Cosmic recycling, we call it. And over time, you develop the elements we have in our bodies. Um, and so to know that, to know that you're made of dead stars or stuff left over from the Big Bang, but which has become conscious yeah. and which can actually understand that and ask questions about that, mm -hmm. that seems to me quite spiritual um, because you know I, I, I view myself as a temporary assembly of molecules and atoms left over from the universe yeah, true here for a short time um i don't believe that anything happens after me you might die but your body doesn't in the sense that the molecules go back again right you now you'll have some molecules in your body which were part of other people in the past or part of the you know or at least part of stars and that connectedness um so my consciousness may go away in my mind i think it will and I know that doesn't sit well with other, you know, faiths, but for me, that's, I think I will be gone. Okay. But this stuff, well, it may become part of something else. And, and, and that, you know, is that it doesn't give me, maybe it doesn't give me kind of the relief that I will continue on, which many faiths look for. But, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't particularly feel bad about that personally. Mm -hmm. Now that we're talking about like, you know, the physical form and the body, what are your thoughts on cryogenics? Because these days you're seeing all, I think I saw a documentary and it was like, it was showing videos of all these like people just freezing their bodies in hopes that maybe decades later or centuries later, they could, I guess, you know, lack for a better word, like defrost their bodies. And, and like, because by that time, maybe there's some technological advancements and they can cure their, you know, whatever physical diseases they had. Do you think that's possible? Do you think it's like logical to do that? Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think those are two different, very different questions. I think it's probably possible. Um, is it happening now? There are quite a few people who've already frozen their bodies. Were they frozen with a correct protocol um, to avoid splitting all the water in the, in the cells, right? I mean, you know that if you put food in the freezer, um, certain vegetables don't come out tasting very good, right? You, you know that some things freeze well, some things don't. And of course, that's been studied over the years. People have looked at how, you know, how slowly to freeze humans. It all sounds very, you know, sci-fi and gory, but it's been done. And there are bodies in liquid nitrogen around the world. Do we know that we've mastered those techni techniques yet? And do we know how to bring them back? 
Um, and will their consciousness be there? We 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 sort of know that you know people can people can die briefly. Um, people can be super chilled by falling into icy lake and then come back alive again. You know, hours later, if they're de kind of defrosted, and they're still the same person, right? So the brain maintains some memory. Do we know that that will happen if you put somebody in liquid nitrogen for? I mean, because we've never tested it, right? It's not a very ethical test. We've done the first bit, put somebody in, but we haven't woken anybody up because they don't want to be woken up until we've figured out the cure for whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, you know, the the technical aspect of deep freezing people uh, it may be conquerable, right? I mean, you can do tests on small animals, and there are even um, much smaller animals called tardigrades, for example. They're, they're called in, they're, they're, they often have the nickname water bears. They're tiny little millimeter scale things, and they live in in, in water. Um, they're everywhere. There's nothing unusual about them, but they look like kind of you know grizzly bears. Yeah, they've blown up. Um, they can completely desiccate themselves when there's when the, they can survive in space. They can go into orbit with outside the spacecraft, um, and they, they have a way of adapting to that circumstance, which then they can come back alive if you sprinkle some water on them afterwards. Now, we can't ask them whether they remember their favorite color. Mm -hmm. Right? They, we, we, there's no way of they they're, they're a bunch of programmed cells. They're not quite the same as having a consciousness necessarily. Now. The other question is, is it something we should do? Mm. The ethical side of it, yeah. Yeah, of course, anybody can make an individual choice for themselves, but this is often sold as, um, there's the extension of this, which is, wouldn't it be great if everybody could live longer? You know, we all, we're all very sad, uh, quite rightly, right, when uh, loved ones and family, and that they die. And, you know, my brother died before Christmas, and uh, no, and, and, you know, he knew it was coming. We knew it was coming, but it doesn't take away from that pain of the memory, right? Um, and you know, whether it's a job or anything, like because we know there's going to be an end, we kind of value our life. I, I feel. I think I, I. I just when I was like a couple of years ago, I was obsessed with like these vampire shows, and and like you see like these vampires who are like immortal and they've been on the planet for like thousands of years, and they're like, and they're like that after a certain amount of time, you just stop valuing life as a whole. And that got me thinking, I'm like, you know what? That kind of makes sense. Cause like, if I, if I was, if a thousand years, 2000 years, like how many partners are you going to have? How many like the people, like, unless like everybody's immortal, like at one point things, things you get used to stuff, you know? Yeah. So th I agree. There's, there, there's this whole spiritual thing between life and death that kind of puts our whole journey on this earth together. Yeah. And I think of course, accepting that is, accepting, is part yeah. of that journey. Yeah. And, and it's something which doesn't come easy. Right. No, I mean, I, not. you and I are sitting here kind of thinking, well, you know, yeah, that's an abstract thing, right? It, it, it's not going to happen. Well, knowing that it is, there's a kind of cognitive dissonance about that. We can talk about it, but we don't have, we haven't quite yet accepted it. Now, of course, I'm a bit older than you, and I've seen people around me um, pass away and, and had to deal with that. Um, and of course, then that brings your own mortality into mind. Yeah. But it's an interesting aspect of life as well. Of course, you know, children don't, they shouldn't be surrounded by morbidity. They should think about um, what's possible for them, what they, you know, what they can enjoy, what they can achieve, how they can make sense out of this life um and when that comes in later and if for some people it comes young some people it comes you know some people try to deny it as long as possible yeah um and our modern society has made that possible in many ways right not 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 only in a kind of you know the the, the ultimate end games like cryonics or genome um alteration but just you know I can go and buy jeans and nobody cares if I'm 55 or 112 and I'm still looking like I'm a teenager, right? Yeah. There's this idea that we sell this business of eternal youth in our modern culture. You only have to look back at mid 20th century. I mean, I say it like it's a historical period. I actually lived through some of that, but <laughs> the world was very different, right? Adults became adults and adults took on responsibilities and they dressed differently. They didn't act like teenagers. Um, I'm on social media, you know, you're on social media, you know, 
age sort of disappears at some level there. It's a place for, you know, I, 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 I find it vaguely embarrassing when 55 year olds act like they're teenagers. Yeah. No, but but our culture is built around that. And I think that acceptance of the life and death cycle has probably, it's, it's kind of been pushed off as if there is a fountain of youth just over the horizon. And we will, if only we try a bit harder, we will find, as you said, you know, if everybody's going to be immortal, then why not? Well, that has its own baggage as well, right? Surely having children and bringing new people into the world is a very fundamental part of who we are. Yeah. Clearly, biologically it is, but even philosophically it is, right? Passing information on, um, ensuring some kind of legacy. But if we're all going to live forever, then we we have to stop having children because yeah, how can we add all those people Oh uh, yeah, sure. You and me having the same podcast for the next thousand years is and that going to be interesting? And I'm ready for that. I am ready for that. <laughs> let's let's make that happen. <laughs> That's a good option for me. And you were you and I liked how you talked about that. That if if um if we're going to be on this planet for so long, like what's going to happen, right? Now that makes me that makes me wonder that are we the only ones on this planet? Like. Um, I, again, this might be coming from my own curiosity after watching so many science fiction movies and stuff, but like, I feel like a lot of people have this question where like, are there, is there life on other planets? Are there conscious beings are on other planets or are maybe, are there actually aliens in our planet and we just don't know about it? Or maybe is the government kind of like classifying it and does not want us to know about it what's well, your take on I, that i would say from the outset you obviously don't have a cat because if you did if you did have a cat you would know that there are aliens on this planet already and they are the cats um you know they well it, it sounds facetious but right we're at the point now where we're perhaps going back to ai we're at the point where we can maybe even decode the language of some animals uh this has been you know for example whales uh, whales have long lives. They ha they carry a culture of sound, um, and whales have different dialects. You can actually hear individual whales and how they speak. In but we don't we can't decode it yeah. yet. The real question is, can we? Right? How intelligent are whales? How intelligent uh, do they carry memory? We know elephants do, for example. Yeah, elephants do. clearly carry memories and and they carry empathy. They carry they they. they boneyards which they go back to where their, their their ancestors lived i mean these are very human things to do um so i think the first thing i would say there are aliens here on this planet we just don't choose to accept that okay um because of the very hierarchical structure of the way humans think of themselves at the top of the pyramid right and and you know they're all just a resource for us to use driving here you know and, and it's different culturally right driving here it constantly amazes me how any of the cows in the streets here live. Yeah, right? I know, because, true. You, you know that, and you you place a value on them which don't get in any other culture. No, they they're food. They belong in the field, kind of thing, right? Um, and of course, there are cultures that eat certain animals that others don't. Um, so I think that that, that that breakthrough with primates and with with cetaceans, you know, there's that. that if nothing else, let's go and figure that out, and and partly because that will also help us if and when we might see aliens or signs of intelligent life elsewhere. You know, how we, if we can't speak to the whales. How on earth are we going to speak to these guys, right? Yeah, true. Perhaps. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, um, actually. Because they're yeah. not going to turn up all speaking English with accurate translators. Yeah, true. No, but, but to come back to the basic principle, um, is there life elsewhere? Um, this is a discussion, of course, that we we talk about in very public terms, in you know, in the sense of people. This is a question people are very interested in. There's a whole technical side of trying to work out how you might go and find this um, signs of life elsewhere. But very basically, you know, there's vast numbers of stars. There's 200 billion stars in our own Milky Way, and there are trillions of galaxies, each with similar numbers of stars. So the number of stars in the universe is is unimaginably vast. And for us to think that we're the only planet at a certain location from the star that the energy allows to have liquid water and we've got evolution in a stable state over billions of years, that just doesn't seem plausible, right? It seems as though that that, that uniqueness argument uh, for life on Earth being the only life in the universe seems very unlikely. It's a whole different question, though. Uh, and, and to be clear, we have not discovered it, but we are on the verge, maybe in the next 10, 20 years, of being able to find signs of life. You might not, you know, unless you go to a planet and you start digging up microbes, which we can do 
in our own solar system. We can go okay. to Mars, for example, and mm -hmm. we have missions which are going there to dig the soil up and yeah. look underground. Um, but at, at a remote distance, we can look at the atmospheres of other planets. We now know of more than 5,000, 5,500 planets going around other stars. We know that if we extrapolate from the things we've looked at, they're everywhere. There are planets everywhere. We can measure their atmospheres. Uh, we can see oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, all sorts of stuff. Some planets are really inhospitable. There's no way we, we would not survive there for sure. But we will, and we, we are on the cusp of finding planets which are very like Earth. Now, if in those atmospheres you also see things which, in a way, require life, so certain certain elements of our atmosphere would not be the same if it wasn't for life on this planet. Uh, it's a non-equilibrium chemistry, we call it, that takes place to do with the cycle of us breathing in oxygen, breathing out CO2, plants taking CO2 in, turning it back to oxygen. If, if, if we and plants didn't exist, Earth's atmosphere wouldn't be the same. Oh, it's not yeah, just yeah. that we use the atmosphere, we, we create it as well. Yeah, yeah. So if you look for that in other planets and other atmospheres and say, whoa, hey, that's strange, there's... There's a kind of a mix here, which could not be, we think, without life. That would be the kind of tracer that you would find. Now, intelligent life, something else entirely, right? Um, we have no evidence for it. And, and I speak, I, you know, nobody will believe him if I say this, but I speak as a member of the European Space Agency. We are not hiding any evidence of aliens. Um, and I can speak for my colleagues at NASA. Of course, you will say, no, you can't because the Pentagon's involved. Scientists are the biggest talkers in the world. We love to talk about what we do. That's why I came here. You know, I was very happy when you invited me to come on the show because I thought, hey, this is good. Let's talk about what we do. We couldn't keep a secret if we tried, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're just not that kind of people. Now, maybe the military, but even then, right? There's so many people in different positions. How would you keep that a secret? So, you know, again, by definition, the conspiracy theorists won't believe that because it's like, oh, you would say that. What, what you know? What 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 can I do? Right? Uh, like you know, um, so you know. But but then that raises the question: If we haven't seen it here, if it's not mm -hmm. here, and we're not hearing radio signals from elsewhere, and we're broadcasting radio signals out into the universe, they can be detected uh, by others. So and so far, we've only created a bubble of radio signals around ourselves about you know a hundred, let's plus or minus a century in size because we've only been broadcasting radio signals for that long. So all stars within 100 light years of us, that light travels, you know, one light year per year, um, that they could have heard us by now, right? If they have an advanced technological civilization with big radio telescopes, uh, the signals get fainter and fainter, of course, as you go further away. But So you need a big telescope. But we're doing that experiment the other way around. We're, we're listening out. Yeah, didn't Stephen uh, Stephen Hawking do, do something like that? I think like he threw some sort of like party or something, and he sent out a message or something through time or something like that. Yeah, it, well, he said he, he held a party uh, and he sent an invitation. He said he um can't remember how he did it. He he held a party and then the next day he sent out the invitations, uh, and then he said if there are any time travelers, they would have received that message. They would have come back and they would have come to the party. Oh, rather okay, yeah. nobody was at the party. It's some, something like that. I mean, he, he, he did something interesting as well, which brings to sort of an experience that I had specifically. Um, he had, he was concerned. So, well, I, or let's go back. One of the possible explanations for what's called the Fermi paradox, Enrico Fermi postulated, look, if, if, if life can form in many places and there's a chance of advanced technological civilizations, where are they? Why aren't we hearing from them? Right. Why, are we, why do we seem not to be able to detect them? And there are many stories, you know, thoughts about the, the Fermi paradox. Um, one of them is the so-called dark forest theory, uh, famously written into the books recently uh, by Qi Jin Liu, uh, the, the three-body problem, uh, which has been made into TV series. There's already, a, I think, a Chinese one. Now there's a Netflix one coming. Oh, I heard that. Yeah. I have yeah, my, yeah. So, uh, one of my friends who were from China, they were auditioning for that show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's, You know, it's a great trilogy of books. It's well worth reading. But kind of a central tenet of, of the book is the dark forest theory. Uh -huh. And the idea there is that if there are advanced technological civilizations out there, then because technology changes so rapidly, I mean, look at us over the last two or 300 years alone, right? Um, you know, from, from having 
killing people with swords to killing people with nuclear weapons. I mean, over a very tiny time, cos cosmically, technology advances rapidly. So the chances of us being at just the same level as the aliens that come is they're either going to be super superior to us because they're millions of years ahead, or we are the ones, you know, we go to Mars and we see microbes, right? So that de desynchronization suggests that um, you need to be very careful about broadcasting and telling people that you're here because um, most civilizations out there, if they exist, they might be kind of benign and they might, oh, welcome to the club, old boy, right? Science fiction stuff. One in a hundred or maybe more or less, and, and you only have to look at Earth to figure this out in the human race. One in a hundred will be aggressive and say, squash you like a butt. Oh yeah, like yeah, I was going to ask that, like if aliens do contact us, do you think they'll be like, doing it just so they can invade us or would they be doing it just to make a relationship? Yeah. Well, the dark forest theory would say that it doesn't matter. If, even if it's only 1%, that's still going to be lots of civilizations. They will come and squash you like a bug. And the reason for that is that because the rate of, of growth of technology might be different for different civilizations, there'll come a time when you're superior to them and they'll squash you like a bug. Um, so it, the kind of the two tenets of dark forest theory are firstly hide okay. don't tell people you're here and two if you find another civilization kill it um so it's incredibly dystopian um, yeah but that brings me back to stephen hawking um hawking talked about this you know this there's nothing new about this idea um he said you should we're being done we're broadcasting signals out into space so we, we should think about what we're doing here it was an intellectual statement right um so fast forward to um, a few years ago when, when Hawking died, um, and we were asked by um, famous musician uh, Vangelis, okay. uh, who himself since has died. Um, we had worked with Vangelis on the Rosetta mission, which I was talking earlier oh, on. Wow. He wrote music for that mission, and we were, and you know, it was a privilege to meet him and be in his studio. And you know, Blade Runner, Chariots of Fire, this is the man, right? Wow, well, wow. Well, um, well. So we worked with Vangelis, and he contacted us and said he he was so inspired by Hawking and the work that he had done, he wanted to um, he had put a piece of music together with Hawking's voice and, oh, and music, and and he and he and he asked for it. He had donated this to the Hawking family, and it was actually played at the what was called the atonement of hawking when hawking's body was placed in uh westminster abbey in london oh okay. um and Haw and, and vangelis in a broad sense said what can you do with this from the european space agency because of hawking's connection with space research mm -hmm. so we said we can beam this message into space um and, you know, so that Hawking's voice and the music would go on out into space. But we were very conscious of the fact that Hawking had spoken about this business of don't send messages into space, right? So I contacted his daughter, Lucy Hawking, and we talked to her about whether what, what she felt he had meant by that. Because after all, let's be honest, adding one little piece of music in the cosmic signals we send out, when we're constantly sending messages out to, to our spacecraft to connect with them, we get data from them. We command them with the same dishes we use. So there's no di just one extra piece of music for five minutes didn't change mm -hmm. the fundamentals. So she said, you know, no, go ahead, go ahead. It'll be fine. Uh, we didn't want to kind of do something which would be contravening what he, yeah. what he, what he believed. But the the fun thing about it, and, and it sounds like it sounds like it's a bit of PR, a bit of a cheat. But I looked up the time when his body was going to be interred in, in, in Westminster Abbey and I I knew which of our dishes we were going to be using to beam the signal into space we had these big um okay 30 meter dishes and we were going to use the one in Spain mm -hmm. and so I figured out what time of day it was um where would we be able to point this dish I didn't want to send it just into straight into space and by sheer luck it turns out that the nearest black hole to earth was going to be overhead at that moment and so you know as a tribute to hawking who famous for, for working on the theory of black holes yeah but we'll send the signal towards the black hole right now it'll take many many years to get there but and the little bit of pr spin was that and, and this isn't true so don't take this seriously but enough people believed it that if we sent the signal towards the black hole it would just go into the black hole and disappear forever and no aliens would be able to hear it so of course, not true because the signal we send out so big, a, a few a few bits of the radio wave go into the black hole. So it sort of felt like we were 
saying, yeah, but don't worry, nobody will come mm -hmm. uh, and invade us because we sent Hawking's voice into space. Um, but, you, you know, this whole, going back to the dark forest theory and, and, and should we um, just be silent? I think that's a very dark and dystopian uh, way of looking at it. There are other answers um, to the possibility of, you know, why we don't hear from other civilizations. And there's a really interesting idea. So the, the basic thing is called the great filter. Where on from microbes to um, us with, you know, podcast microphones and so on, where on that technological route does the great filter occur? Where does life um, basically stop to the point that we never hear from it, right? You know, so uh, philosopher at Oxford, Nick Bostrom, comes up, has come up with this kind of endpoint uh, the, the two extreme ends of the great filter spectrum. Mm -hmm. And one of those is that life is incredibly uncommon, that life just does not form very often. The particular circumstances that happened on the earth are so rare that life never even gets to be microbes, very rarely, oh, okay. and therefore never gets to be us. Yeah. Um, uh, and then the chances of that happening in this vast universe are so small that, yes, it might be in a few pockets, but it might have happened you know, millions of years ago, or it won't happen for more, millions more. We're just crossing over in the night. We won't hear from them or we won't, hear, you know, they won't hear from us. Now, the other end of that, which Bostrom postulates is, no, actually, life is quite common mm -hmm. and arises in many places. The great filter happens when we get to this, when we get to podcasting, by which I don't mean podcasting, but the technological abilities to do that, because this is accompanied by the ability to kill ourselves as a civilization, right? We live in a world where it is possible that we could end it all, either per semi-purposefully with nuclear weapons or kind of by dumb accident through climate change uh, or other a, a range of other things. And so Bostrom says, you know, maybe the great filter's there. You, you only get to live for 100 years after you get to the point of being able to send signals because that comes with all the technology which allows you to wipe yourself out. Wow. And if you're not clever, then you're dead. Now, here's the thing, and this is where Bostrom is, you know, makes a really interesting point. He says, if we go to Mars or we go to one of the icy moons of Jupiter, say, and we discover life there, which is what we're trying to do, right, the scientists, if we discover that there is life in those places and it developed independently of here on Earth, then that says life does develop everywhere because twice in one solar system. And that must mean that the great filter is the other one that people kill themselves off. So Bostrom would say, you really, really don't want to find life on Mars. Because if you did, then that means the great filter's coming and we're about to kill ourselves. Now, of course, it's philosophy, right? It, it, it's playing with, 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 with ideas and it could be something else entirely. But uh, these are in, in some way important questions, I think. Yeah, no, and you, you touched a topic that I actually wanted to elaborate on. Um, you talked about Mars, right? Now, of course, like there's all in all these news channels, uh, you see Elon Musk is um, trying to, you know, send people to Mars. Now, my question in regards to that is, what do you think it's more about humans inhabiting another planet? And is it more commercial? Like, do you think it's going to be more like people are going to go there, like, you know, really rich or wealthy people are going to go there for a vacation and stuff? Is it more on that end? Or is it like, is it more like, to, like to save resources on the earth we're we're trying to expand where we live and do you think it's logical even to think about moving and and kind of creating society in other planets like mars or yeah so those are those are motivations of course i mean the motivation for low earth orbit space travel with virgin galactic or with spacex you know going up and then having bragging rights when you come back to the golf club right it's, it's a little bit like the endless queues of people going up everest um, you know, you pay enough money, you can get dragged up Everest. I mean, there's still a chance you'll die. So there is a risk. Same as sitting on a rocket. There's a chance you'll die. Um, people are willing to take that risk effectively for bragging rights. Um, now, sure, I would love to climb Mount Everest, right? It would be cool. But um, that way, where there's these long lines of people who move one step every five minutes because mm -hmm. there's such a queue of people, that, that can't be a spiritual thing, right? Um, so that space tourism, I think, for low Earth orbit is a real market for people who have lots and lots of money. And that, that, will, that will increase. Mm -hmm. Making a commitment to going to Mars, a nine-month journey one way, and then waiting on the surface for 18 months and coming back, that's a, you know, that, 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 
that's a commitment. Um, but the the rationale which people in this domain cite is uh, making making the human species multiplanetary is often posited as an insurance policy. It's suggesting that yes, we may screw this Earth up. Um, we also might get hit by a, a, a large asteroid, as killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, there are other well, things like the super volcano. I mean, asteroids we might be able to detect in advance, and we are doing this. Uh, we have a mission going um, uh, either later this year or next year called, called HERA. HERA is going to an asteroid. It was visited by NASA's DART mission a few a couple of years ago. The DART mission actually deliberately hit a small moon going around the asteroid, uh, and it changed the orbit of that small moon. And this was a demonstration that you can perhaps deflect asteroids before they come and hit Earth. So we're going back to revisit this thing uh, with Hera soon to see exactly what happened in that area. You know, what happened to the asteroid? How did the material get spread out? What's the strength of the asteroid? These sorts of things. So you could avoid perhaps um, an asteroid, um, but a super volcano, if Yellowstone erupts again, I mean, think about the, the Deccan traps here in India, this vast plateau of, of volcanic material that went on for, you know, I'm not a geologist, let's say hundreds of thousands of years or even longer, perhaps. Um, just volcanoes do that on the Earth. And the super volcano, we are not going to be able to stop it, right? So the the theory there is we need to get off Earth as soon as possible to, to, to put bits of ourselves on Mars or elsewhere. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of this. Um, I'm not saying that it isn't something we can do or something that we might even want to think about doing, but... There's a real sort of philosophical issue about that for me, and that is that it, this is escapism at some level, partly because the thing we're running afraid of, most people are, is, is something which is climate change, and the world is changing, and we are responsible for that change. Like, oh, let's just go to Mars and it'll be fine. It's like, no, we, no, you really, really don't want to go and live on Mars. There's nothing we can do to this planet, Earth, including nuclear war, which will make it as bad a place for humans to live as Mars is. Mars just isn't made for us at all. It's just not, wow. you know, you'd end up living in caves or under bubbles. Exactly, and, that's you know, what I was thinking, yeah. yeah. Now, okay, there's this, the idea that over long periods of time you could dump water into the atmosphere and terraform. It's like, okay, okay. I mean, yeah, nothing in the laws of physics says no, but, but it's also the hubris. It's this idea that we've somehow qualified at this point to become interstellar or intergalactic, that we... We've demonstrated our abilities to the point that it's fine that we go out there. And I'm not, you know, in a philosophical way, I'm not really sure we're ready for that. I don't think we have demonstrated that. Wow. Um, and then just in a purely numerical way, um, let's say you need a million people to go to Mars to ensure the genome. To You know, you can't send three people, right? Because they'll all very quickly, genetically, that doesn't work to preserve the whole human race. Um, so let's say it's a million, and that's a number that's thrown around. So... It's either a million really rich people because they can afford it and they go privately um, and they all go there and they arrive and they say, all right, who's cleaning the toilets? Because <laughs> it's not me. I'm a yeah, rich person. I didn't, I didn't come to Mars to clean the toilet, right? Yeah. That makes um, sense. Or you, you do probably what would be more sensible, which is to pick um, a million people randomly from the earth. Okay. Um, now, a million people is roughly one in 10,000 of the population of earth. You don't know 10,000 people. I don't know 10,000 people. So it's not going to be somebody you know. It's not going to be you, statistically. It's not going to be your family. Um, it's going to be random people from around the globe. And the whole philosophical idea is then they're going to Mars to save the human race, but they're not saving you personally. And that's that great dichotomy that we have is the individual, the personal, who am I? Okay. And where does my altruism go? You know, how, how do I feel about other people? Mm hmm and that altruism for different groups of people is different, right? It's just my little tribe, my little group of people, my football team, or it's the whole of humankind. But it identifies with humans. It doesn't identify with the DNA. This idea that sending our DNA out there and having humans go on is somehow what everybody wants to do. You know, that I would give everything and only to be able to save the human race, but I don't actually mean anybody that I know. Really? Have we really got to that point that we believe that? 
and the extremum of this is quite an interesting thing, which actually just drives me bananas, uh -huh. is that there are some people in Silicon Valley who think that we should also not only save the human race in the solar system, but prepare the rest of the, the, the galaxy for our arrival. So some people have already posited sending DNA, our DNA and our microbes yeah. on interstellar probes to other stars to land on those planets and spread our genome ahead of us arriving. Uh, yeah, right. Now, um, you know, it's great science fiction, but there are genuinely people talking and thinking about this these days. And it just worries me this is some kind of... Um, it's, a, it's, it's an illness at some level, right? Uh, that society has got to this weird point that we can't even fix the stuff here. I mean, I'm in Delhi, right? A, 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 a city of enormous contrast in one taxi ride. You see the rich and the poor and the, 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 the haves and the have-nots. Um, and, and for all the will in the world, and all countries are working to eradicate poverty, and of course, in Western Europe, we're not free of it by any means. So this isn't a judgment thing. It's just the world. We, we're deciding to move on before we've even kind of fixed the place where we are. Um, and, and for all the statements about altruism, I'm doing it for humankind. It's like, well, actually do something for humankind then. Yeah, no, I agree. I was like, that's what I was thinking. I was like, if you're putting so much money and so, so many resources into, you know, creating these missions to move humans to Mars and all that, can't you spend some of that money or that resources into fixing the actual problems that are happening on this earth? Whether it's, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the population growth issue or anything, right? Yeah, and the yeah. argument there, of course, is you can do both. Which is probably true as well. Um, so you, we, you, this, I don't think it's an excuse. I think genuinely people believe this. You know, I can also help the planet while preparing for the next stage. Um, and there is an argument, and this is this is a, an interesting one: is that if indeed we are reaching the brink of civilizational collapse through all of the issues which we, we face, that we need to be taking this step now because we won't be able to take it in a hundred years' time. Right. If you genuinely believe, if it is you think that the human race should go on um, as a species, we should be doing it now because we might not be able to in 100 years now. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I've been talking to some people recently at this conference that I've been at here in Delhi and other things. You know, some people are very, how do we bring people together on this that it doesn't then, I, for example, one of the things that people struggle with is that it's become identified with the billionaires, right? It's become identified with Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and others. That, that they have appointed themselves or have been allowed to appoint themselves the, the kind of arbiters of the destiny of humankind because they have the money and they have the power and they have the lobbying and maybe have, they have a vision of some kind that they are now in the position to do this. If we were to do it properly, though, shouldn't we do it from a governmental level, a civil level, an institutional level? Um, so I had conversations with um, some people where we said, well, well, shouldn't we come together and figure out how to do this without it being identified with the billionaires, because there are all sorts of reasons, perhaps, that we shouldn't be identifying with them um, in, the, in the, their kind of cult, the, the way that they, they've become extra beyond kind of the control of governments and everything else, right? Um, that putting your destiny in the faith of billionaires to save the human race, well, when, when was the last time that ever worked, right? Um, now, you can also say, no, we shouldn't, because if we die, we die, and that's a kind of form of karma, and if we can't fi figure ourselves out. So that there, there become, becomes quite philosophical there, right? I mean, it's quite, it would be perfectly reasonable to say, sorry, if we can't fix this planet and make it livable, then we deserve to, you know, to expire. And other people rail against that and say, no, I know how to solve this piece of the puzzle. Let's go and do that, even though the rest of it's not working very well. I don't have an answer to that, but I think sometimes the, the kind of cult aspect of you're a Luddite, you don't want to go into space, you don't want, I, I work for a space agency, I do want to go into space. But I think the philosophy of some of this kind of cult of escapism is a little worrying because it is a bit of, you know, I'm leading into the future, it's the destiny, and it's for the good of you, trust me, it's all for your good, yeah. but, uh, but I'm doing it this way. Uh, who made you God? Yeah, no, I agree. And you were talking about Elon Musk, and I think, I think I read this somewhere where like he was like advising people to go buy pieces of land on the moon. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know that he, he's been involved. And I don't really mean to focus on him. I mean, in a way, he's a, a, a symptom rather than a cause, right? We've created a society in which amassing such vast wealth is possible. As the phrase that some people use is, you know, every billionaire is a policy failure. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> 
you know, we, we, we've, we've built a world in which this is possible, right? And, and the fact that he likes sci-fi and so does Bezos, this is, you know, the, the, the sort of an inevitable. I don't want to personalize it with them. And I know if I do, I'll have, you know, the, the fanboys come and attack me. So, you know, that, that's, and it wouldn't be the first time. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think the, 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 the fact that we're in this particular position is a symptom of the way the world is. This kind of a febrile end of, you know, end of the Roman Empire kind of sense about it a little bit. And it's like, we, it's become a bit of a free-for-all. Um, and institutions have become distrusted. Uh, and that's been weaponized at some level, right, uh, by populist politicians coming in and saying, don't trust the elite, don't trust government, don't trust hierarchy, don't trust, I, I will save you, me, me personally, my view. And we see that in Western Europe, we see that in North America, we see that around the world, that populism as a way of garnering support, but also creating division, yeah. Um, yeah. pulling people apart to say, it's not my fault, it's not your fault that things aren't working, it's, it's their fault, yeah. right? And we see this in buckets. I mean, Brexit is a classic example of that, right? The, the, the British, a small fraction of the British, but enough that it was a majority in the referendum of the people who voted, said, let's leave the European Union because we don't want those people coming over here, right? Yeah. It's like, how can, you, how can you cut yourself off from the biggest market on your doorstep? Um, I mean, I'm unabashed about that. And I don't care who comes after me for that. That was a, the biggest mistake that's been made in the UK in, in hundreds of years. Um, we'll, we'll pay for it. Um, but, but, but that's just a microcosm of populism spreading around the world. We now have to say the words, but you know, this year is full of crucial elections around the world. And yet we're at this point where democracy is being manipulated partly through social media, maybe through people who put money into lobbying or also by hacking people's inner wishful thinking and instincts. Like, I want you to tell me everything's going to be great and that me and my family and my people are going to be cool, right? We're, we're going to, and if that means demonizing those people, okay, I'm, I'm for that, you know? And I think, really? Uh, you know, I mean, racism is rife and alive and it's a thing that exists in the world and, you know, it's hard. It's, it, you can kind of see how it is if it's constantly manipulated. The, the idea of the nation state and people going to war over bits of land, I mean, again, everybody... This, this is enough, there's no great place in the world for this. There's no bad place in the world. It's just how people are. Yeah. And yet the challenges which face us will only be solved by us all working together. So there's the dichotomy. And at the time where division is happening, the things which we need to fix require us to be together. No, definitely. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I personally learned a lot and I really feel like the audience um, will be able to pick up a lot from what you've said. Um, hopefully we can do this again, but regardlessly, um, it was an honor. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. You know, it's a pleasure to be here. Third time I've been to India. Let's see what happens on the fourth time. Let's do it. <laughs>